the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. Despite projections that Democrats might lose the House to the Republicans, she is pretty upbeat, saying it is clear that House Democratic members and candidates are strongly outperforming expectations around the country. Well, I'm joined now by Charity Elder, who served as the senior advisor to Mike Bloomberg's presidential campaign in 2020. She's also the author of Power, the Rise of Black Women in America. Thanks very much for joining us. Obviously, there, there was a lot of expectation that Democrats would do uh, more badly than they seem to be. D do you have any insight as to why that might be, that this projected red wall doesn't seem to have actually materialised? Well, thank you for having me, Gita. It's a pleasure to, to be on. Um, well, first of all, the Republicans, um, they were wrong and, you know, their polling and, and what they thought was obviously incorrect. So they overshot. So that that's the first thing, um, you know, in terms of what what we're seeing this morning. And second, a lot of um, independents, you know, according to early exit polls, 49 percent of independents went Democratic, according to uh, AP's early exit polls, which normally it is the opposing party, the party that's not in the White House, uh, that does better with independence. And so that could have something to do with, um, you know, the rhetoric around, um, you know, the GOP and the far right um, extremist uh, part of the party. Nevertheless, obviously, the House could still, it is still projected to, to be lost by the Democrats. How worried are you about what that does for President Biden's ability to get through his agenda, his legislation? You know, it, it's less of a worry than a than a acknowledgement of the challenges. Um, it was already difficult for Biden with, with the slim majority um, in, in Congress and also having some of the uh, Democrats not voting along with the party. And so that will just make it that much harder to actually get things done, um, you know, for the country. Um, and so concerns, uh, you know, for me around climate, also what happens with Ukraine. Um, and so and then also just the issue of if we get mired in uh, impeachments and, you know, drummed up allegations are concerns of mine. Can I just ask you very briefly, if Ron DeSantis ends up running on the Republican ticket, is Joe Biden still the person to, to lead the Democrats into the next presidential? I think he is. And if Joe Biden wants to run, I will be supporting him. Um, and he's the only one so far uh, that's been able to beat Trump. And so until someone emerges that does that on a better um, in a better way, I think Biden is still the man for the job. Charity Elder, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Great to speak to you. Sorry we're out of time, but thank I hope you. to speak to you again. These are the latest pictures from Capitol Hill's results still coming in on the balance of power in Washington, which affects, of course, all of us right around the world. Thanks for being with us. Hello there. The overriding story for the weather in Europe is how mild it is for this time of year. A southwesterly flow is driving milder right across Europe. Yes, there are weather fronts and yes, producing some showers and strong winds at times, but the temperatures way above where they should be really for the time of year. So on Wednesday, we've got some uh, showery outbreaks of rain moving through France across to the Alps, also down into the Pyrenees ahead of it. Dry, settled, sunny, still pretty warm. We're looking at temperatures into the mid-20s for southern Turkey, low 20s for Greece and for Italy as well. So there's that rain, some of it quite heavy indeed. Windy across that west coast for Portugal with a few sharp showers here. Mild in Paris with 16 degrees, some showers extending up into Copenhagen and across generally into Scandinavia. So that's the story. As we go into Thursday, we'll see a good deal of fine dry weather. That southwesterly flow taking some wetter weather across parts of Ireland up into Scotland. And eventually it's going to be moving its way into Norway too. So let's take a look at the city forecast then. That rain easing, it'll be mild in Norway until next week when we'll start to see some cooler air. That mild story continues into Paris, temperatures into the mid-teens. For much of Eastern Europe, dry, settled and sunny. Few showers for Valletta from Saturday. When the only constant is change, the only way forward is to jump in. 
and as the energy landscape transforms faster than ever. Essential intelligence from S&P Global brings together critical data, price assessments, research and insights so you can control where the winds of change take you. A better future awaits. It's yours for the seeking. S&P Global. Seek and prosper. Having a global perspective creates a deeper understanding. Because in our connected world, all news is international. The impact on Europe and the rest of the world would be devastating. So, for in-depth analysis of the biggest stories from the US and around the world. Relations between Russia and the West have reached a new low. Join our team and find out what is really going on. BBC World News America. It's amazing to be a woman covering some of these major sporting events that are happening right across the world because we all come at life from different perspectives and I think the more you can have a range of voices and outlooks in our output, it just makes for such a richer tapestry of stories. Not many expected the team behind me to get this far in the tournament. They're proving to be this World Cup's surprise package. I've been privileged to cover loads of the big sporting events for BBC over the years. There's a lot of rugby Union, a lot of golf, two women's World Cups, so he was able to go to Tokyo and to Beijing. The one thing you can say about sport is that traditionally it has been mostly represented by men, whether it's men competing on the pitch, whether it's men covering the stories, and that is definitely changing. The focus in this Olympics in the 100 metres is all about the women. I get younger women coming up to me asking me for advice or saying they want to get into this industry. This has been a hugely rewarding experience for me being part of it. And and it is all in order to showcase the very best of women's sport. Women's sport feels like it's being turbocharged at the moment. Record-breaking crowds, increased investment, bigger pay for players. I think there's nothing but exciting times ahead for women's sport. Really, anything is possible now. I stand with Afghan girls and Afghan women, and I want to bring attention to their voices. No, Russia is not red and not pushist. Russia is such as she is. And we are not ashamed to show ourselves as such as we are. I would like to think that we can see a new range of leadership traits being modelled, where kindness is not seen as weakness. 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 Where In our connected world, all news is international. So, for in-depth analysis and correspondence covering both home and global events, get a deeper understanding and find out what is really going on. BBC World News America. Now on BBC World News, your daily briefing on business and economics from the world's financial centres. From New Broadcasting House in London, World Business Report. This is BBC World News. I'm Geetha Gurumuthi with the headlines. As the results of the US midterm elections come in, Republicans are on course to take control of the House of Representatives, but with a much narrower majority than predicted. But the Senate fight is on a knife edge, with the states of Georgia, Arizona and Nevada yet to be called. The Republicans have lost a key seat in Pennsylvania to the Democrats, with John Fetterman projected to win the state. He suffered a stroke in May and beat Republican opponent and celebrity doctor Mehmet Oz. It's been a good night for the Republicans in Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis increased his share of the vote, but Donald Trump warned his potential rival against running for president in 2024. U.S. voters have also been casting their ballots on a range of other issues. Vermont and California look to have approved enshrining the right to abortion in their state's constitution.
Hello, very warm welcome to World Business Report. I'm Samantha Simmons. In a minute, we'll uh, be looking at all the impact of the US midterms. It has been a dramatic night in the midterm elections. We look at the economic consequences. Massive job cuts in the tech sector with Facebook parent Meta letting 13% of its workforce go. Well, we start with those US midterm elections. The result is still too close to call, but it looks likely the Republicans may gain a majority in the House of Representatives. The economy, of course, has been a big factor in these elections, with inflation the dominant economic concern for Americans. We'll have more on that in a moment. First, let's take a look at how financial markets have been digesting the development so far in the US. Uh, well, late on Tuesday, Wall Street did see a rally before any result had been announced. Let's take a look at the European markets now. Uh, the FTSE 100, let's have a look, uh, down, uh, also impacted by retail figures though, the DAX and the CAC current also down. This is how the Asian markets ended the day. Japan's Nikkei retreated from a two-month high, but that was also to do with poor results from video game maker Nintendo weighing in. Chinese shares also slipped as data showed China's producer prices fell for the first time since December 2020, underscoring faltering domestic demand amid COVID-19 curbs. Well, let's cross arrive now to Susanna Streeter, who is Senior Investment and Markets Analyst for Hargreaves Lansdowne for some more analysis. Hi, Susanna. Great to see you as always. Um, I guess we need to see how the US markets react to the results that we have in so far to see how the world markets are, are going to be impacted by these midterm elections. Yes, and at the moment, it's still very much a wait and see approach. I think not so much movement uh, so far as far as futures are concerned. And I think that is because actually what we're expecting is some kind of political deadlock, because if Republicans do edge ahead in the House of Representatives fight, it means uh, that uh, they are likely to stop uh, fresh legislation being brought and crucially stop more stimulus uh, potential as well. And that is why we could see a positive reaction on financial markets because Joe Biden's stimulus uh, projects and schemes have been criticised for adding to inflation, which is soaring in the United States. And of course, we know that the Federal Reserve is trying to rein it back in by raising interest rates. So there could be uh, an uplift if deadlock is expected. On the other hand, it does raise questions about uh, budgets and potentially the US facing a fiscal cliff. And that is when uh, Republicans stop uh, the Democrats and Joe Biden's administration for perhaps raising the debt ceiling uh, to fund government expenditure. Yeah, and also, Susanna, we've got really important key inflation figures out today which are going to factor into the market reactions. Absolutely. And I think it's going to be the inflation figures that are going to be really the focus of investors, despite all the political maneuverings uh, because uh, that really has been moving markets in particular the reaction uh, of the federal reserve the u.s central bank in its monetary tightening there are expectations that it will become a, a bit uh, softer in terms of rate rises in the months to come but a lot will depend on the numbers out this week yeah and given the fact that we may not know all of the results for some time how do the markets tend to factor that in well, I think certainly uh, it will be this kind of a wait and see approach. Um, no news in a way is good news. Uh, so certainly they won't react in an adverse way because it would be more likely that the status quo um, is achieved rather than any dramatic moves. And I think it is the kind of inflation question and whether spending could be reined in, um, which will be really focused on as far as general market moves are concerned. There could be some other sector moves and that those could emerge when perhaps there's haggling that goes on in the months to come if there is a Republican uh, majority in the House of Representatives. Susanna, thanks very much.
Now some breaking news to bring you. A Meta Platforms is laying off 13% of its workforce or more than 11,000 employees. It is one of the biggest tech layoffs this year as the Facebook parent battles soaring costs and a weak advertising market. Joining me now is our technology editor Zoe Kleiman for more on this. Hi Zoe. And these figures just out. There was a warning yesterday from Mark Zuckerberg but we're now getting the details. Exactly. We did know that this was coming. I mean it is massive. It's considerably bigger than the Facebook layoffs. That, uh, sorry, than the Twitter layoffs that we had uh, earlier in this week it does show doesn't it that big tech is really uh, having to tighten the the purse belts at the moment if you like um, Mark Zuckerberg had a really contrite tone in a message to staff he's apologized he said he continued to invest in new things we know he's invested 15 billion dollars in the metaverse you know this project that might not come to fruition for 10 years over the last two years he said it did that off the back of the pandemic because there was an increase in people using products engaging with adverts and business was booming and he misread it and he didn't realize that actually that was going to uh, to slow down again so it's a really interesting tone for him to take very different to the sort of bullish tone that we heard from Elon Musk just a few days ago and um, he's offering 16 weeks of pay to those staff that are being laid off plus two weeks for every year that they've been employed he said he's uh, suspended access to company systems but he's going to keep their email addresses live so that they can all communicate with each other what we're seeing here is a much softer and 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 probably more kind approach, actually, to what is really quite a brutal round of layoffs. Yeah, it really is. 11,000 employees. What does this say about the future of the company with its stock tumbling more than 72 percent? Zuckerberg has absolutely committed in a very singular way to the metaverse. If he's right, if he's right and it comes together and everybody uses it, then he's absolutely uh, following the right path. But it's a long time to wait. You know, the metaverse, you've got to remember, doesn't actually exist yet. It's still being built. And there are going to be rival metaverses built by other companies as well. He's taking a huge gamble here that this is the next step of the way in which people interact with the web. At the moment, you know, we write stuff down, don't we? We share pictures and videos. And this is us actually being inside the web ourselves. It's a massive leap. It's an interesting bit, potentially, of social engineering. And he's certainly betting his bottom dollar on it. The question is, are the staff that remain going to go with him. There must be incredible nervousness um, among employees. You know, is he doing the right thing? Is this the right direction for this firm to take, especially as revenues are tumbling? Yeah, as you say, he's betting his bottom dollar. He's lost a huge amount of his own personal wealth, hasn't he? He has. I mean, don't feel too sorry for him. I don't think he's going to be uh, not able to pay the heating bill anytime soon. But yes, he absolutely has, because, of course, his wealth is very much tied up in, in shares of uh, Meta, which is a massive company, you know, owns WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. It's got lots of fingers in lots of pies. It's too big to fail. I don't think we need to say that time is up for Meta right now, but I think we're going to see a really uh, a tough repositioning of the firm, certainly in the, in the, in the uh, beginning of 2023. And Zoe, just briefly, I don't know if you know this, but will employees who have been affected, will they know by now if they're one of those laid off? I suspect it's being rolled out. My understanding is that he's speaking to uh, all staff and that the the statement that's now been issued, you can see it, by the way, on the Meta website, um, was issued after staff were made aware, yes. OK, Zoe, thank you very much. Well, plenty more on that on our own website, bbc.com forward slash news. That's it for me. You can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Samantha TV News. Thanks very much for watching. I'll be back a little later with more business stories. Bye for now. I'm in London to visit a new exhibition of Korean culture which explores how what's known as Hallyu, the Korean wave, which includes cinema, has swept the world since the 1990s. You may well be familiar with this scene. It's the bathroom setup from the film Parasite and it figured very prominently in the movie, especially when it flooded. It's been very carefully recreated here at this exhibition under the guidance of the film set designer. Parasite is, of course, a movie that changed the perception of Korean cinema around the world, especially when its director, Bong Joon-ho, won the Best Picture Oscar in 2020. I think Parasite has really brought a, uh, a renewed confidence into Korean cinema. And Parasite fans will be glad to know that there is more to come. An HBO series set within the world created by the film is in development. It's not a time machine, although it has the power to revive history.
and explore any possible future. It's not simply a timekeeper either. It certainly holds our fondest memories, but also our deepest questions about who we are and who we aspire to be. It's not merely a sign of the times, for it reflects the unalterable passions in our hearts, the constant obstacles on our way, and our willingness to take them on, always. It's not just 24 frames flickering every second. It's a testament to what truly moves us, a legacy that lives on, and a quest that knows no end, a perpetual movement. It's cinema. How do you seize an opportunity when you can't see it? Essential intelligence from S&P Global sheds light on your private market investments. Fighting information scarcity and bringing together critical insights, access, and technology. Because when everything works together, you'll find value where others don't. A better future awaits. It's yours for the seeking. S&P Global. Seek and prosper. For the first time ever, television viewers in their homes would now be able to watch the crowning of their queen as it happened. Whenever we got another refusal from the government, out would come the banner headline, government still opposing BBC TVs. Because we knew we were right. We knew the public not only wanted to see it, but deserved to see it. The BBC was the fortress of British culture. You were allowed to make a film in any style you liked. It was my film school. BBC children's programmes were deeply respected. If it had been on any other channel, it would not have had the same power. The BBC has helped to define who we are. It's helped to define our identity. One was able to do what I'm committed to do, which is to make films about real people and real people's lives. You might say iconic is a bit of an overused word, but the BBC Marconi Type A literally is an icon. The basis of the symbol on most computers worldwide. This is BBC World News with the latest news and results from around the globe. Sport today. Hello, I'm Holly Hamilton and this is Sport Today, live from the BBC Sports Centre. Coming up on the programme, Pakistan are the first team through to the T20 World Cup semi-finals after beating New Zealand. Gerard Piquet's blistering career ends with a red card while he's on the bench. And widespread criticism of one of the World Cup's official ambassadors who describes homosexuality as damage in the mind. Hello, welcome along to Sport Today. Thanks for joining us. Well, we now know the first team through to the T20 World Cup final. After Pakistan beat New Zealand in a thrilling match in Sydney, New Zealand finished top of their group, only losing to England. Uh, they recovered in this match from 49 for three to post 152 for four. But it was Pakistan who prevailed by seven wickets. Opener Mohamed Rizwan top scoring with 57, helped by 53 from fellow opener Babar Azam. And Pakistan are probably still in disbelief that they made it through, having lost their two opening games. So Pakistan will return to the MCG, the ground where they won the 1992 World Cup for their final on Sunday. Action and reaction to come in later editions of Sport Today. The question is, who will they face in that final? The second semi-final will be taking place on Thursday, with England regarded as slight underdogs to reach Sunday's marquee match at the MCG, not helped by injury concerns over Mark Wood and Dawid Milan. Both players went through fitness tests away from their teammates during Wednesday's training session. Now, batter Milan, who sustained his groin injury in Saturday's win over Sri Lanka, is less likely to feature while fast bowler Wood has taken part in limited training after reporting general body stiffness. 
tactically it, it may be a bit different um you know the, the dimensions and the, and the surface we play on obviously have a big um impact on on the way you bat and bowl on on those surfaces so um we've done some good planning we've had guys who've played at adelaide before and um you know we we go into the game with some good ideas and, and we'll react well on our feet when we have to. I think having talked to the groundsman, he seems uh, really confident that he's had a lot of time um, to get some really good work into the wicket. He seems very comfortable that it's going to be a really good surface and a consistent surface. So, um, no, at the moment, have no worries about the pitch. Well, Virat Kohli and Sheera Kumar Yadav are the players in form for India as they expect their captain Rohit Sharma to score some runs in the crucial semi-final match. India boasts the heaviest run scorers of the World Cup but they have reached the final on just one of the last six occasions. We do understand as well that we have to play good cricket to uh, win that game. Uh, which I think we've done this, uh, we've done in this tournament. Uh, we just need to stick to it. Uh, I know we're a long way away from it, uh, but I think it's important to just uh, understand that uh, it's a contest between bat and ball, uh, which we have to come come on top uh, with. And yeah, and, and stick to uh, and trust what you've been doing so far. Brittany Griner, the WNBA star, sentenced to nine years in prison in Russia for having cannabis oil in a vape cartridge, has reportedly been moved to a notorious Russian penal colony. The two-time Olympic gold medalist was arrested in February at a Moscow airport, a week before Russia sent troops into Ukraine. The White House has called her detention wrongful. She had an appeal against her nine-year sentence rejected last month. Gerard Piquet was sent off at half-time in his final match before retirement as Barcelona came from behind to beat Osasuna and move five points clear at the top of La Liga. And Piquet was dismissed despite being on the bench after appearing to remonstrate with the referee. He was angered by the decision to show Robert Lewandowski a second yellow card in the 31st minute. Barcelona taking full advantage of Real Madrid's loss at Rayo Vallecano on Monday. Well, Senegal forward Sadio Mane is reportedly set to miss the World Cup after the Bayern Munich attacker limped out of their 6-1 win over Werder Bremen on Tuesday. French newspaper L'Equipe are reporting that Mane has suffered a tendon issue, so faces weeks out, which would rule him out of the World Cup, which starts in a few days' time. Sergei Gnabry opened his account with a curling shot to make it 2-1 to Bayern Munich and then completed his hat-trick in style in the 82nd minute, evading three defenders before scoring between the goalkeeper's legs. Matthews Tell scoring Bayern's sixth as they extended their lead at the top of the table to four points. Napoli won their 10th Serie A game in a row to sit eight points clear of AC Milan at the top of the table. They beat Empoli 2-0. Luciano Spalletti's side are now guaranteed to be top until uh, the new year anyway. The Naples side have never won the title without Diego Maradona, with their two triumphs both coming during his spell there. Now, there has been widespread criticism over comments made by one of the ambassadors for the Qatar World Cup, uh, that homosexuality was a result of damage to the mind. Those are his words. Twelve years on from the decision that led to a tournament, now just 11 days away, the man who oversaw the vote, former FIFA president, Sad Blatter, says the decision to award it to Qatar was a mistake. Our sports correspondent, Jane Dougal, has more. A protest to pressure FIFA days before a World Cup in a country where same-sex relationships are illegal. And fresh controversy, as former Qatar player Khalid Salman, now an ambassador for the tournament, was asked about homosexuality. He told a German broadcaster it was haram, which means forbidden, but he went further, denouncing same-sex relationships. But do you think gay is haram? It's haram. Because why is haram? I am not big, one big Muslim, but it's haram, why? Because of damage in the mind. At this point, a World Cup official steps in, bringing the interview to an abrupt halt. His words, though, have upset many, including Helen Hardy, the founder of LGBT football team Manchester Laces. 
it was so definite um, what was said and uh, so deeply offensive and, and I don't think it could be taken any other way so we're quite clear on, on how they feel um, about LGBTQ plus people. The 2022 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. It's been controversial from the start. 12 years ago when Qatar was given the 2022 World Cup, there was wide criticism. Not just on the outlawing of homosexuality, also their poor human rights record and unbearable temperatures forcing the tournament to be moved to the winter months. The then FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, was a champion of the decision at the time. However, speaking to the BBC for an upcoming Five Live podcast, Blatter admitted it had been a mistake, not for any of the obvious reasons. It's a big, big organisation which needs also a big country. Qatar is too small to do that. I said to myself, I was right at a certain time to say it is, we should not go there. Labour MP Luke Pollard, who is openly gay, says this cannot happen again. I think FIFA has real questions to answer about how they make sure that the World Cup goes to places where fans can support their team, be true to themselves and not have to hide in the closet to be able to support their national team. More than a million visitors are expected to travel to Qatar for the World Cup. Despite the words of Khalid Salman, the coast country's organisers have said that everyone is welcome. Jane Dougal, BBC News. More reaction to that story on the website, but from all the team here on Sport Today, goodbye for now. Indian rice genetic diversity boils down to something like 110,000 varieties. Out of this, not more than 6,000 varieties are left. I started collecting the seeds from the farmers who were still cultivating those varieties. The South is Vrihi, the seed bank was established. It's the traditional varieties which are the best bet to survive. In our own collection, we have hundreds of varieties which are resistant to different types of pests, different types of diseases. By reinstating the traditional custom of open source seed exchange among farmers, I've been successful in empowering farmers' community to attain their own sovereignty over their own means of food production. Hello. From our recent satellite imagery, we've been able to watch Nicole bearing down to the north of the Bahamas. Intensifying to hurricane strength, the system is heading towards the east coast of Florida. Dangerous storm surge as it makes landfall. Of course, hurricane force winds, but heavy rain could be the biggest issue. This is spatially quite a big storm system, and it means that we've got some widespread heavy rain to come for the southeast of the US, eventually the mid-Atlantic and the northeast. It's heavy snow, though, that's going to be the concern for the west across the Sierra Nevada into the northern plains. Some unseasonably cold air still sitting across western Canada and the western US. Unseasonably warm to the south of the South American continent on Wednesday, but it will turn cooler here from Thursday for southern Argentina and Chile. Also very much on the mild side at the moment, Europe. Uh, we've got a front pushing down into Central Europe through Thursday, unlikely to bring much in the way of early season snow because of the mild air, we're much more likely to see rain. Temperatures are sitting slightly above average too for northern Libya, Algeria and Morocco. Quite cool across uh, southern Africa for South Africa, Namibia, Botswana and Shari to the east of South Africa as well. It's also cool across the Caucasus and there's further showers to come here. Some isolated down Downpours for parts of Saudi Arabia pushing in to the northern Gulf on Thursday. This area of low pressure, though, will mean much more meaningful rain for the southeast of India. We could see some localised flooding here, also looking wet for the Maldives and Sri Lanka. It stays fairly solidly dry, though, for eastern China in our shorter term outlook and unseasonably warm for the likes of Shanghai. A little cooler and more unsettled for the northeast of China, though, in the days ahead. Some heavier showers will target the southeast of Australia through the end of the week and it's looking very wet for the North Island of New Zealand not just for Thursday but for Friday as well and on Friday there's the risk of that rain being accompanied by gales or even severe gales. BBC? 
past here or are they going to get past you in these areas? Nowhere near. How soon do you think it could be before there is a real fight in here? I just think. They couldn't come with you. What do you read about what's happening on the ground? Where were you at the exact time of the attack? If that is what you think of him, how do you sit across the table to try to stop the war? And we're live in five, four, three. We are faced with the greatest threat to food security in generations, supply chains turned upside down by conflict and COVID, population growth and climate change. With every one of these problems being felt in the fields, I'm talking to farmers across three continents to find out if they can rise to the challenge. Join me, Amanda Little, for Follow the Food on BBC World News. This is BBC News. I'm Laura Trevelyan, live in Washington with our continuing special coverage of the US midterm elections. Here are the top stories this hour. Republicans are likely to take control of the House of Representatives according to the latest projections, but it hasn't been the wave they were hoping for. It's a dead heat in the race for the Senate with four key races still to be called. Georgia may be heading for a runoff vote in December. Republicans have lost the key Senate seat of Pennsylvania to the Democrats. John Fetterman defeats the Donald Trump-backed candidate. It's been a good night for Republicans in Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis is re-elected with an increased share of the vote, boosting his credentials as a presidential rival to Donald Trump. We saw freedom in our very way of life in so many other jurisdictions in this country wither on the vine. Florida held the line. U.S. voters have also been casting their ballots on a range of issues. In Michigan, Vermont and California, voters amend their constitutions to protect abortion rights. Hello, I'm Laura Trevally and welcome to our continuing special coverage of the US midterm elections. Voters here in America are waking up to find that control of Congress is still in the balance. The red wave that Republicans were hoping for was more of a red ripple. Republicans are on course to take control of the House of Representatives with a narrow majority. Our control of the Senate is still too close to call. It could all come down to a runoff race in Georgia next month. President Biden's Democrats outperformed their polls. Our former President Trump's influence on the Republican Party is coming into question this morning after his hand-picked candidates fared less well. Let's take a look at the big picture so far and the races we're still watching. Let's cross to my colleague, Lewis Vaughan-Jones. Lewis. Laura, thanks so much. Yeah, we're going to take a look at some of the numbers and it is close. Look at the Senate, 48 Democrat, 47 Republican, pretty close at the House as well. We'll come back to the House in a moment. Let's start, though, by looking at what's happening with the Senate. So at the moment, we know the Democrats, of course, control both houses. So the job of the Republicans is to get to 51. At the moment, they're on 47. And the main problem for the Republicans so far is the big story overnight was Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania was a Republican seat coming into these elections. And look at that. The Democrats, 50 percent, Republican, 47 percent. So the Democrats take control. And John Fetterman there has already given his victory speech to his supporters. He defeated Dr. Oz, Mehmet Oz, the Trump-backed uh, candidate. So the Republicans already 
on the back foot when it comes to the Senate. So that brings us up to date now. What are we looking at right now? What do the Republicans need to try and get over that 51? Nevada and Arizona. So let's take a look at Arizona. This is a seat that they will be targeting. And at the moment, you can see it's being called as a Democrat lead. So it's not being called yet, but Democrat 52 percent, Republican 46 percent. And look at that down there, 93 percent of the votes in. So it's a challenging picture.